Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word, written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We're going to take hold of it. We'll apply it. And we know it's going to produce fruit as we hear and do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We are sharing with you on the subject of healing. We've talked about the principles of healing, how healing belongs to all Christians. We've talked about why Christians are not healed. We've talked about unscriptural traditions, ungodly, unscriptural traditions about healing, including, as we talked about, Job and Paul's thorn this past weekend. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the subject of how to receive healing from the Lord. How to receive healing from the Lord. First of all, you need to know that it's absolutely the will of God for you to be in health. 3 John, verse 2. Beloved, I wish, which means to pray, above, which means concerning all things, that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. It is the will of God for you to be in health. God does not want anybody sick. He doesn't make them sick. He wants them to be healed. The devil is the one who causes the sickness and disease. Jesus is the healer. We've seen the fact that the covenant-keeping name of the Lord in the Old Testament was Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that healeth thee. He is the healer. He's made a covenant with us, and he will perform the word of his covenant. We've seen the fact that it's absolutely the will of God for everybody to be healed. And if you're going to be able to receive healing, you've got to be established in these principles. You also must know what Jesus accomplished for us. We know that Jesus went to the cross. He not only took away our sin, but he also bore away the sickness and the disease. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, speaking to the cross, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Past tense, looking at what Jesus accomplished on the cross. You were freed from sin, and you were freed from sickness and disease legally in Christ. That doesn't mean that you can't sin, and that doesn't mean that you can't be sick. That means that Jesus accomplished the sacrifice in the redemption, and now it legally in Christ, according to our covenant rights, we have a right to walk free from sin, we have a right to walk free from sickness and disease. Healing belongs to us. It is our right. We're supposed to live unto righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. It is a doctrine of the church. And God wants everybody <clears throat> to walk in victory and possess their health. We also must understand, as we pointed out, that Satan is the one who is the cause of the sickness and disease. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Jesus is the healer. And what was the problem? Oppression of the devil. This is why we got to deal with the devil if we're going to get healed of sickness and disease because it is oppression of the devil. God wants us to arise and begin to cast out the demons and destroy the works of these spirits in our life. Now, in order for us to receive healing, we must realize that if you're going to receive healing, you must receive it with your faith. Your faith, it is what is going to bring forth healing in your life. In Matthew chapter 8, we see over here, verse 8, here's a centurion. This particular centurion, he had a servant who was lying at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented, and Jesus had said, I'll come and heal him. Well, the centurion said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. The reason he was not worthy is because he was a Roman. He didn't have a covenant with God. But he called him Lord. He understood one thing, though, about Jesus, that Jesus understood authority and how it's released. He understood the fact that it's released through speaking words. That's why he said, Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. He went on and said, I'm a man under authority. He was under authority to Caesar and Rome. 
having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. Because he was under authority to the Roman government, he was in authority over the soldiers under him. And because of that, he could speak commanding words that released the authority that was delegated to him by the Roman government, and they would obey. Well, he saw the same thing in Jesus. Jesus was under authority to the Father in heaven, and in authority over sickness and disease and all evil spirits, and that when Jesus would speak commanding words, that then that would release the healing power of God, the authority, and it would destroy the sickness and disease, as the sickness and disease and the devils would obey as he had authority over them. Well, when Jesus heard it in verse 10, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Great faith is shown in those that understand that when you speak commanding words based on authority delegated to you, and that you are under authority to the Father in heaven, and begin to operate with the authority given unto you, that God is going to move, and he is going to bring forth his promises, and in this case, healing will come to pass. Well, it comes down here in verse 13. He said to the centurion, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. As he believed, as he believed, it came to pass in his life. You've got to realize that as you believe the Word of God, and you believe the authority that's been given unto you, and you understand that when you speak commanding words in the name of Jesus, speaking to a sickness, disease, or speaking to evil spirits to cast them out, speaking and releasing healing power, that those commanding words will bring the manifestation of the authority and the power of God to bring forth healing. And it's all through your faith. Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. Here we see, when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he's coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and, and Jesus said to him, Believe you that I'm able to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. They had to believe that Jesus was able to heal and to deliver them from their blindness. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith be it unto you. Notice, he said, first of all, believe I'm able to do it. One, you've got to believe that Jesus is able to do it, that he has the power to do it. But it's not just believing that he's able to do it that's going to get it done. Their faith had to go into operation. That's why he said, according to your faith, be it unto you. You believe I'm able to do it? Now your faith is going to take hold of this and see this come into manifestation. Your faith is what is going to bring forth the healing power of God to come forth in your life. Their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it, because their faith made them whole. Over in Matthew chapter 15, we see over in verse 22, here's the woman of Canaan. She came out of the same coast, cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Here she's calling out for mercy. He didn't even answer her a word. Why? Because, again, she wasn't in covenant relationship and he didn't come to those except for those of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. He answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He told her this. But she came and worshipped him, and saying, Lord, help me. He answered and said, It's not meat to take the children's bread. What was she seeking? Deliverance. Deliverance is the children's bread. It belongs to every one of us that are children of God. And to cast it to dogs, those are outside of the covenant. She was a dog. So sorry, children's bread's not for dogs. But she said, Truth, Lord. She accepted that. She accepted the fact she was a dog. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. In other words, she understood the masters were going to eat first, but then the dogs were going to eat with the leftovers, or what was going to come after that. She understood that the gospel came to the Jews first, but it was also going to come to the Gentiles later. And so Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. She had faith 
that even though she wasn't in covenant relationship with him at that point, she was going to be down the line, and that the things that God had promised would come to the Gentiles, to the nations. Great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Notice that she worshipped him. She called him Lord. And she knew the fact that the gospel was going to come to her and that healing and deliverance was available for her daughter. And so because of this, he said, your daughter was made, the daughter was made whole from that very hour. Over in Mark chapter 5, see it's your faith which is going to make you whole. Mark chapter 5, we see over here in verse 25, it says, A certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, she'd suffered many things of many physicians, she'd spent all that she had, she was nothing better, but rather grew worse. Now that's not saying that doctors are bad, doctors are good, doctors help, they're trying to help. In this case, the physicians couldn't help her though. In fact, she spent all she had, cost money, and it was nothing better, but rather grew worse. That meant the devil continued to do the work against her. When she heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. She touched his garment. And in doing so, she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Because she saw the fact that power was resident in Jesus. And if she could just touch something that was in contact with him, that the power of God would come into her and that she would be made whole. So straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Healing power came into her. Jesus immediately knowing himself that virtue had gone out of him. What's virtue? The word virtue is the word dunamis, if you see in the lower window. Normally translated power is the way it should have been translated, but here it's translated virtue for some reason. It's only three times it's translated virtue out of the 120 times, it really means power, is the word dunamis. So, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Jesus didn't know the fact that, who, who it was that touched him. He knew that power had gone out of him, but he didn't know who that particular one was. Well, the disciples said to him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and thou sayest, Who touched me? He wasn't talking about touching me physically. He was talking about touching me with, to take hold of the power of God in the Spirit, to see the power of God with their faith, to see healing flow in, because they felt the power of God go out of them. And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. And the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Her faith took hold of the power of God that was resident in Jesus. Jesus, how do we contact Jesus today? Through the Word of God. He is the Word. You can contact Him through the Word and you can take hold of the power of God and it will flow into you as well. As the Word is the power of God. The Bible says the gospel, which is the words, the power of God unto salvation, produce healing, it'll produce deliverance, it'll produce the promises of God. So as you get the word in you on healing, then that word in you will produce the power of God so that you can then take hold of that, act upon the word with your faith and see the power of God work to bring forth healing and wholeness in your life. She touched Jesus with her faith and she was made whole. In Mark chapter 10, over in verse 46, they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jer Jer Jericho with disciples, a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You notice all these ones were always talking about the son of David. Why? because they understood the Davidic covenant was of the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God that was going to come forth. And so they were calling out for him who would operate in the kingdom, the rule and the reign of God, to have mercy, which is the love of God in action, to bring healing to them. And then he charged him that he should hold his peace. He cried, the more a great deal, the Son of God, have mercy on me. Otherwise he wasn't going to be denied. He was going to press in. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. 
They call the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garment. Why did they have a garment? The blind were required to wear a garment to show that they were blind. He cast away his garment. I'm not going to be blind any longer. I'm not going to need this any longer. Rose and came to Jesus. Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? He made the man verbalize with his mouth what he wanted to receive from him. The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight, that I might recover my sight, literally is what it says. It's not the word lambano here. It's just a word, one word here that means to recover my sight. Lord, that I might recover my sight. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way. Thy faith, not Jesus' faith, his faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus in the way. Notice, his faith is what did it. What did he do? He, was caught, he knew the fact that Jesus was the one who operated the kingdom of God, the rule and the reign of God. He also knew the fact that Jesus is the one who was going to release mercy. Mercy would come to, from God as he would come and take hold of it, which would bring healing. And he wasn't going to be denied. In fact, he cast away the garment and came to Jesus and verbalized what he expected. Lord, calling him Lord, that I might recover my sight. And his faith made him whole, and he received healing. We see the fact that healing is going to come forth through your faith. We see another scripture over in Luke chapter 5 in verse 17. Luke 5, 17. It came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Notice that. If Jesus was there, the power of God was present to heal them because he was teaching the word. You see, Jesus would often teach the word and then confirm the word would be confirmed with signs following. The power of the Lord was present to heal him as he was teaching the word. Behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. Here, they couldn't get in. They couldn't find a way by what they, so they brought him in because of the multitude, uh, by what way they could bring him in because of the multitude. They went up upon the housetop, let him down through the tiling in the roof with his couch in the midst before Jesus. We're taking off the tile. We're getting in there. Doesn't matter how we're getting in there. We're coming, coming. We're going to get to Jesus one way or the other. And when he saw their faith, Jesus sees your faith. He hears your faith by your words. He sees your faith by what's in your heart. And he also sees your faith by your actions. He said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee, or sent away from thee. Afiemi. Afiemi, which means to send away. Remember, this is before Jesus went to the cross, so nobody could have their sins washed away by the blood of Jesus because the blood of Jesus wasn't shed yet. He was sending away or remitting these sins away. Now, why was that important? Obviously, Jesus knew, knew had revelation that his sins were the reason why he was in the state he was in. So he had to deal with why he was in the state he was in. That shows you that we got to deal with sin. If we're going to operate in faith and receive the healing power of God, we've got to deal with our sins. We're going to have to deal with everything that has brought anything evil into us from sin. That means our own sins. That also includes people that might have done evil things to us. We're going to have to forgive them. We can't have any unforgiveness. And also, regarding the sins and iniquities of our forefathers that have been visited upon us from the gener third and fourth generation, we've got to deal with the sins. That's why we confess our sins or we forgive everybody that sinned against us, and we remit the sins and iniquities of our forefathers so that we're breaking the right for, the, for that sickness disease that came in from the sin to be able to continue to keep us bound. That's why Jesus dealt with that. Scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this that speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive or send away sins but God alone? Well, Jesus was operating not as God. He was operating as a man under the old covenant, doing what the Father told him to do. When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said unto them, What reason you in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Thy sins be sent away from thee? Or to say, Rise up and walk? In other words, he had authority to either do either one, which he even about brings forth in the next verse. 
but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority. This word power is the Greek word exousia, which means authority, as Young's literal has corrected the King James error. The Son of Man has authority, not only to bring forth healing, but also to remit sins, forgive, which means to remit sins. So he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. So Jesus remitted his sins, which was the cause of the problem, and then he spoke for healing as he declared for him to arise, and then take up his couch and go into his house. And this man was healed and set free, praise God. He immediately arose, went up before them, took on that, where he lay, and departed to his own house, and he was glorifying God. Faith is going to see the victory come forth. In Luke chapter 8, we see down here in verse 50, here is the ruler of the synagogue. When he heard the fact that his daughter was dead, trouble not the master. When Jesus heard it, he said, Fear not, believe only. She shall be made whole. If negative circumstances occur, do not get in fear, do not give up, believe. If you have a promise of God, now you can't just make things happen for someone. You have to have a promise of God that it's going to happen. Well, he had a promise of God. He had to believe. The healing was under the old covenant. It belonged to him. Jesus already said, I will come and heal her. In the Mark chapter, Mark's account, Fear not, believe only, she shall be made whole. He didn't get in fear, so you're going to have to block you have to deal with that fear. You can't let that fear get a hold of you. Fear and all the aspects of fear, which includes doubt, wavering, wondering, any aspect of causing you not to act on the word and believe and take hold of the promise would be some element of fear working. Believe only, and she shall be made whole. And what did he do? He continued on. Believing, by the way, is not just a mentally ascending in your mind. Because she went on with him and followed him on, she, or he, did, he did, in order to see her be raised up. They went forth. They came into the house and went on straight forward. And, of course, the lady, the girl, was, ended up being healed and raised from the dead. Of course, when he got there, uh, Jesus wouldn't even acknowledge the fact that she was dead. He said, Weep not, she's not dead, but she sleepeth. They laughed him to scorn, knowing that she was dead. He put them all out and took her by the hand and called, saying, Made arise. Go to minister to somebody, you don't want any unbelievers around. Get rid of them. Put them all out. You only want people that would believe. He said, Made, arise. He spoke commanding words. And her spirit came again, and she arose straightway, and he commanded to give her meat or food. She was raised from the dead. Jesus did it. And he operated through the word of God and through the faith, through the authority that had been given unto him. We see another case over here in Luke chapter 7, 17, verse 12. Here's where he's entered into a certain village. There met ten men, ten men met him that were lepers, stood afar off. They lifted up their voice and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When they're calling for mercy, they're calling for healing. Because mercy, grace is God's favor towards us. Mercy is the love of God in action toward us. And the result is it's going to produce healing. When they saw he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. Otherwise, why would he tell them to go show themselves the priests? The only reason you go is because you're healed, and you're proving to them that you are healed so you can be restored to society. In speaking that, they had to believe that healing power was flowing into them, and that as they went, that by the time they got there, that healing would be manifested. It came to pass as they went, this shows obedience to what Jesus said. It produced the healing as they went, and they were cleansed. In this case, they were cleansed of leprosy. Cleansing means that the, it got rid of the disease, but it didn't get rid of the effects of it, because leprosy eats away parts of your body. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back with a loud voice, glorified God. And he fell down on his face at the feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? What happened to the other nine? You'd think that they all should have been there. There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. He's called a stranger because he was a Samaritan. He was like a foreigner. And they said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. This isn't just being cleansed. 
This is now being healed and made whole. Otherwise, he just wasn't cleansed of it. He was healed and restored of the effects of it. How was that happening? Through his faith. His faith. Not only his faith of going, acting on the first thing that Jesus said, but the fact that he came back and he glorified him with a loud voice. And he fell down on his feet. He was giving him thanks. You give him thanks. You look unto him. Jesus will bring forth making the person whole and healing and wholeness. And that's exactly what happened to him. We see another case over in Luke 18, verse 35. Luke 18, verse 35. Came to pass, he was coming to Jericho. A certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. Hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they which went before rebuked him, he should hold his peace. He cried so much the more, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive or recover my sight. And again, we see what happened. Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. Thy faith hath saved thee. Recover thy sight. That's basically what he told him. Thy faith hath saved thee. Notice that salvation includes healing. The word is sozo, -so, which means to be healed. Your faith not only will produce salvation, it'll produce healing for you. And so the result was the man was healed. Immediately received his sight, followed him, glorifying God and all the people. Healing is received through your faith. We see a scripture over in Acts. Acts chapter 3. Here's when Peter and John went up together at the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried when they laid daily at the gate of the temple and called beautiful. They asked alms of him that entered into the temple. They're looking for, he's looking for money. We're seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asking alms, and Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said, look on us. He gave heed unto them expecting to receive something. He's going to get some money. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, what did he have? He had authority in the name of Jesus. And he had the power of God that could be released to bring forth the healing. He said, such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. He spoke in the name of Jesus and he spoke commanding words. See, you sp always speak commanding words. Jesus said, command ye me the work of my hands. He would always be speaking commanding words. Be open, be healed, be thou made whole. He would speak commanding words. Arise, whatever it was. He took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Notice, he spoke the words, took him by the right hand, lifted him up. And then it says his feet and ankle bones received strength. The fact is the fact that healing power was flowing into him and he had such confidence, he just lifted him right up. And the healing power of God made his feet and ankle bones have strength. He received strength. They were made solid and firm. Of course, the guy stood up, leaping, walking, entering into the, te the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They knew it was he that went always sitting for alms at the, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what, that which had happened. Well, when they come down to seeing, being interrogated before the people, he says, His name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. That shows you that faith is what is going to receive. And it's through the name of Jesus, but not just speaking in the name. It's the faith in the name. Name through faith in the name. You've got to have faith in the name of Jesus. When you speak in the name of Jesus, you've got to understand that he is coming personally and present and active by the Spirit through the power of attorney that you speak forth in that name and his power and his authority is going to be manifested as you believe. You believe that you speak in the name of Jesus, it's going to happen? It happens. Otherwise, it's not just the name. It's through faith in the name. Those seven sons of Sceva, they, they tried to use the name that Paul preached and they got torn up by the evil spirit overcome and fled out of the house, tore off their clothes, they were fled out naked. They were, it didn't work for them. 
In other words, it's just not the name, it's the faith in the name. The name through faith in the name is what will bring wholeness and soundness. We see another case in Acts chapter 14, verse 8. There sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly behold him, perceiving he had faith to be healed. He was hearing the word. See, the key is you hear the word. And once you hear the word on healing, then faith comes through that word. Then you are to act upon it. In this case, he was perceiving that he had faith to be healed. He said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. He command, spoke commanding words to tell him what to do. And he got up. And of course, they saw what had happened. Then, well, the fact that man was healed and was made whole. Faith is what is necessary for you to receive healing. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the Bible says this, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You have the faith of Jesus Christ. You must understand that when you were born again, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. That's talking about someone who's born again, who now has the spirit of Jesus Christ in them, which is what you get when you're born again. And what does it say? The life which I now live in the flesh, that's in this physical body, how does he live this? I live by the faith of the Son of God. How can you live by the faith of the Son of God? It wasn't saying I'm living by my faith. It's the faith of the Son of God. How do we, I mean, he says I got the faith of the Son of God. How did he get the faith of the Son of God? When he got the Spirit of Christ, he also got a spirit of faith. And you must understand that you have a spirit of faith that will enable you to receive healing and receive the promises of God. 2 Corinthians 4.13 says, We having the same spirit of faith. That's speaking to all of us. All of us, we have the same spirit of faith because you've got the same spirit of Christ. Now, According to it's written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. In other words, we got to put our faith in operation. You have a general spirit of faith, but you got to put it in operation. Now, what am I going to put it in operation on? Upon the Word. When you hear the Word, what happens? It's going to produce faith. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. When you hear God's Word being spoken for, and the Word is coming into your heart, it is producing faith. Faith is of the heart. Hope is the area of the soul. And so as faith comes into you, you now have a general spirit of faith, and you have specific faith through the Word that you heard. And you hear it on the subject of healing. Now you are to put your faith in operation. As you hear the Word and you act upon it, your faith will grow. And that is important. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 speaks about the fact that your faith groweth exceedingly. Your faith is to grow. Your faith is going to grow as you receive the word and act upon it and put it into operation. In fact, we know from Luke chapter 17, Luke 17 and verse 5, Here's where the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith, or cause our faith to grow, add to us, cause us faith to get strong and grow. What did he tell them to do? If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, that means just a little bitty seed, what do you do with it? How am I going to get it to grow? You might say unto the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. In other words, how do I get my faith to grow? by putting it into operation. You put it into operation when you begin to work your faith. I believe, therefore I speak. I begin to speak and I begin to release my faith and put it into operation as I'm working my faith. And that is important. The more that you work your faith, the stronger your faith will develop, it'll get. It'll get, grow as it's going to develop and get strong. And your faith is to grow exceedingly, as we saw, and you're to become strong in faith. 
In fact, we even see over in Romans chapter 4, talking about Abraham, where it says he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. You give glory to God for what he has promised that you're going to take hold of that, and you're going to speak that into being. You're going to take hold of the promise, and you're going to see it come to pass. Your faith is what is going to produce. He got strong in faith. He had to grow. He had to get his faith strong. You've got to get your faith developed, giving glory to God. As you get your faith developed and you put it in operation, then you're going to see the results come to pass in your life. It's important that we realize over in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 29, he says this, when he touched their eyes, he said, according to your faith, be it unto you. According to your faith. Otherwise, according to what your faith is, will be what is going to be manifest to you in your life. God's word is the truth as you believe God's word and you act upon it and do what it says and work your faith and cause your faith to grow strong by the application of it, your faith will grow and become strong and you will see the results. We see a scripture over in Mark chapter 9. You've got to realize that your faith can grow and develop so that you can receive whatever you have need of. Because in Mark 9, 23, Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. What is it that you want, have a promise of God for, that you want to see come to pass? You need to exercise your faith. You believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. You need to put your faith in operation so that your faith will grow and it will develop. It's going to develop as far as when you're speaking promises into being, you're going to speak them into being and you're going to hold fast your confession. You keep speaking the word. As you keep speaking what God says, where well, you're speaking it in prayer, just confessing the word, declaring what he is doing for you. Hebrews 4, 14, seeing we have a great high priest that's passed in the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our Profession, which is the word homologia, which means confession, which is saying the same thing, saying what the word says. You are going to hold fast continually what you are speaking. What are you confessing? You're speaking something into being. You're speaking the promises of God into being, to see them come into being. You see, we've got to realize that your faith is going to take hold of the power of God to bring healing in your life. We see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, speaking of Sarah, through faith also Sarah herself, she had to do this, received lambano, took hold of power, it's the word strength, is the word dunamis, which means power, to conceive seed. And she was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who'd promised. First of all, you gotta have a promise. You're going to have to believe that promise. You're going to have to judge him faithful who promised that he is one who performs his word. He's able to perform it and will. But then also she had to take hold of the power of God to conceive seed. So you must have a promise. And you know he's faithful. And you're going to take hold of the power of God to bring forth the healing power to flow into your body so that you can be healed. In fact, we see mercy is healing. In fact, we're going to look at some scriptures for a little bit about mercy, showing the fact that it is healing. When that, those guys were calling out for mercy, in Psalms 103, verse 8, the Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. First of all, you've got to know God's mercy is available. His mercy doesn't lack. He's plenteous in mercy. He is a God who is full of mercy, and he wants to bring forth mercy in your life. In fact, we see in Psalms 145, verse 8, again, the Lord's gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. He has great mercy. Otherwise, there's no limit to his mercy whatsoever. Psalms 36, verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he's good, for his mercy endureth forever. His mercy wasn't just for a short time. His mercy is available all the time. 
His mercy endures forever, which means His healing is enduring forever. The mercy of God is available for you to see healing come forth. And let's look at some of these scriptures that we looked at before, but we didn't really focus on this aspect. In John chapter 9, down here in verse 35, here we see Jesus went about all cities and villages, teaching their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He had compassion or showing mercy on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Jesus would preach the gospel and he would show forth compassion upon them. And they were getting healed and set free. We see a scripture over in Matthew 14, in verse 14. Jesus went forth, saw a great multitude, was moved with compassion toward them, and healed their sick. He is full of compassion and mercy, and he will bring forth healing. We see in Matthew 20, down here in verse 30. Here's the two blind men sitting by the wayside. And when they heard he passed, they said, Have mercy on us. They're calling out for the mercy of the Lord. And they rebuked him, of course, to hold their peace. They weren't going to be denied. They were calling out for mercy as well as referring to him as the son of David. He was the one who has had the king kingdom, the rule and the reign of God, and mercy was available. So, of course, what was the result? They got their eyes open and they ended up getting, seeing the healing come forth. We saw the same thing in Luke chapter 18. Mercy is healing. It is available for every one of us. His mercies are new every morning. Here's that blind man that we saw. Here he was again calling out for have mercy on me. And they just tried to stop him. And what happened? He recovered his, his sight with his faith that saved him. His faith took hold of the mercy of God. Now what about mercy for us today? Is it available to us? Absolutely. Look here in 1 Peter 2.9. It says here that we're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. It's talking about us now. And we've been called out of darkness in the marvelous light, which in time past were not a people. We're not the people of God. But now are the people of God. Because we've been born again. We're a people of God now. Which had not obtained mercy. It wasn't part of their right. Didn't belong to them. But now have obtained mercy. That means mercy is your legal right according to the covenant. It is a covenant right. You already have obtained mercy. That doesn't mean that it's manifest. Whenever you see these past tense words, like when it said that you were healed, it doesn't mean that it's manifest. That means it belongs to you. It's been accomplished. Have obtained mercy means it belongs to you and it's available for you. What are we supposed to do in order to see mercy come to pass? Well, Hebrews 4 tells us what to do experientially to see it manifest in our life. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain. The word obtain is lambano. Lambano is a Greek word normally translated receive, which means to take hold of. It is a taking hold of with your faith. You are taking hold of mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is why you can pray a prayer of faith and take hold of the mercy of God. As you speak forth His Word, you take hold of these things, mercy will come into manifestation. In fact, we see a scripture over in Hosea, chapter 10 and verse 12. It says this, Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Remember, you're supposed to live unto your righteousness. By His stripes you were healed. One of your rights is healing. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. You can sow to yourself according to your rights by speaking of them, speaking into being the promise, and you can reap in mercy. As he says, break up your fallow ground, unsealed ground, talking about which is all type of our heart, for it's time to seek the Lord till he come and reign righteous upon you. As you get his word in you, knowing your rights, and you begin to sow to yourself in righteousness, you will reap in the mercy of God. Now, you can't be looking at your circumstances, though. If you look at your circumstances while you're looking for the mercy of God, you're not going to see it come to pass. It's very important that you realize mercy is available from the Lord. In Jonah chapter 2, 
Remember Jonah had rebelled against God and he went overboard and ended up in the fish's belly. In Jonah 2, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. Here he's in this state and he begins to pray. It's the smartest thing that he did. He began to pray. When you begin to pray and you begin to contact God, you pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. You start to pray the word. He makes the statement, they that observe lying vanities forsake or relinquish and give up their own mercy. In other words, mercy was available for Jonah. If he would have observed the lying vanity, which was the state that he was in, something that's worthless, a lying something that is worthless, and vanity also refers to that, something that is absolutely worthless, that has no bearing on seeing God manifest himself. What was the lying vanity? The fact that I'm in the fish's belly, it looks like there's no way out, and how am I going to get out of here? Well, that was worthless to even consider. We're not going to observe the situation. All the things that need to be changed, that can be changed because of the promise of God, those are all lying vanities from God's perspective. If you observe the state of things that you're in, you're going to forsake your own mercy. But if you get your eyes on the Lord and see what He can do, you can see the mercy of God come to pass. He did. He says, I'll sacrifice him to thee with a voice of thanksgiving. He's going to start thanking him for delivering him from that situation. Of course, he had to repent. I'll pay that that I vowed. He decided, I'm going to repent, and I'm going to get right, and I'm going to go preach the gospel like I'm supposed to. Salvation is of the Lord, he declared, who is where it comes from. The salvation is of the Lord. He's the one who's my deliverer. And the Lord spake unto the fish and vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. That tells you that mercy is available. It doesn't matter what your situation is, even if you got into it through sin, which he did. If you will look to the Lord, not look to your circumstance, if you will look to him, and if you will begin to sacrifice to him with the voice of thanksgiving, thanking him for delivering you, knowing salvation to the Lord, and repenting at the same time and getting yourself right, what will God do? God is full of compassion and mercy. He spoke to the fish and vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. If he can do that, he certainly can get you out of your situation, whatever it is. He can deliver you, bring you out of that, and set you free. You see, we've got to realize the mercy of God. He has great mercy. In fact, if he is truly your shepherd and you're following him, Psalms 23, verse 6, at the end of that psalm says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Mercy is available. You just have to take hold of it and see it come to pass. Well, how are you going to get it? You're going to get it from the Lord. Are you going to get it by looking at your circumstances? No. It's not going to happen. First, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18 tells us what we're to do. While we look not at the things that are seen, we don't look at our circumstances. <clears throat> we don't look at what's going on in the natural. We understand what's going on in the natural, but we know that anything that's going on in the natural, sickness, disease, that's all oppression of the devil. And we know that the things of God are in the realm of the spirit as well as dealing successfully with the enemy. He's in the spirit. So what are we going to do? We're going to look at the things which are not seen, which is what? The realm of the spirit. The realm of the spirit controls the natural. When you do the things that are necessary in the realm of the spirit, you will see the natural change. When you do what's necessary in the realm of the spirit to take dominion over the devil and cast those spirits out, you'll see the changes come. You get your eyes on the Lord and take hold in the realm of the spirit of the promise of God and pray the prayer of faith and take hold of healing, then you're going to see it manifest. The things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. But you've got to put your faith in operation. He says, we believe, therefore we speak. You've got to get your faith working. You know, faith is not just believing and that's automatically working. No. What does James chapter 2 say? James chapter 2, several places, but here it says, faith, if it doesn't have works, it's dead. Being alone. You've got to work your faith. You've got to put your faith in operation. Your faith is something that you put in operation. That's why, why did Jesus say to cause it to grow? Put it in operation. Speak. 
When you speak, your faith is going into operation. When you do the word in some capacity, acting on it, your faith is in operation. And we see the fact that he says, Thou hast faith, and I, I have works. These men may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I'll show thee my faith by my works. What you're doing is showing forth your faith. It's not a matter of just believing. It's a matter of believing and then working your faith, putting it in operation, necessary of whatever is so, to receive the healing power of God. We've got to work our faith. Now, what kind of methods are scriptural for us to receive healing with our faith? We see in James chapter 5, verse 14, Is any sick among you? If anybody is sick, what's the responsibility of the sick person? Let him call for the elders of the church. Notice it's the sick person's responsibility to come to the elder of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. We anoint with oil. People want to come and be anointed with oil? We anoint with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith, the prayer of faith is that we believe that we take hold of the promise of God. We believe we take hold of his healing mercy to flow into your body. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. Notice, it says it shall come to pass. doesn't say it's going to happen instantly, necessarily, sometimes. Praise God when it does. But it says it shall come to pass. And the Lord shall raise them up. That shows us the fact that healing will come forth through the anointing with oil and the prayer of faith. We see a case over in Mark chapter 6 where the, the disciples were going forth. Verse 12 says, They went out and preached that men should repent. They cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. What do we need to do? We've got to destroy the works of the devil. That's why we cast out the demons. Anoint with oil many that were sick. And what happened? They were healing. Oil is a type of the Holy Spirit. Anointing with oil is simply a type of the Holy Spirit's power to flow into a person to see healing and restoration come forth. We also see another way of releasing healing is through the laying on of hands. Mark 16, 18 says, They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. When you lay hands, that's contact. What's going to happen? What's in you can flow out of you into them. When power is resonant within you, it can flow out into that person. So here we lay hands on the sick. We release the healing power of God and what the, the Holy Spirit power flowing forth, and it will bring forth a recovering. Healing will flow through laying on of hands. We see a case over here in Luke, chapter 13. Over here when the woman... The, uh, that had this uh, spirit of infirmity for 18 years. Jesus cast the spirit out of her, when you understand what really happened here, and then he uh, laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made straight. First he dealt with the spirit, then he released healing power into her, and she was made straight and glorified God. And we'll cover that about the cast out in a minute when we get to that part. Acts, <clears throat> Acts chapter 28 here we see a case over here in verse 8. The father of Publius lay sick of a fever and a bloody fixed flux to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. You've got hands. If you get the word of God in you and you go forth and you lay hands on people, healing power will flow through you into the people. And what happened? He laid his hands upon him and the person was healed. When this was done, others also which had disease in the island came, and they also were healed. He was releasing healing power through the laying on of hands. Healing also can be received through prayer, a prayer of agreement. If you pray in line with the word, you can pray a prayer of agreement regarding the promise of God. He says that if, any, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask, by the word, the word, by the way, the word ask is the word iteo, for those of you who haven't been here before, Iteo means, when we look it up in Strong's, a demand of something do you according to, which is the promise of God that belongs to you. Otherwise, you agree as on touching anything that you should make a demand to what's due you. It shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Because remember now, 
In the New Testament, all the promises are ours, and we make a legal demand of what's due us by praying the word, and then we take hold of it, praying a prayer of faith. That brings us to the next point. Another way that you receive is through the prayer of faith. Mark 11, verse 24, is an example of the prayer of faith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, the word desire is iteo, again, a demand of what's due you. When you pray, believe that you receive, the word receive is lambano, which means a self-prompted taking hold of. Believe that you take hold of it, and you shall have it. That shows you that what are you going to do when you pray a prayer of faith? You're going to bring the word, the scripture promise, and you're going to believe that you take hold of that. How do I take hold of that? You do it with your faith in the realm of the spirit, not in the natural. It's in the realm of the spirit. And as you take hold of it with your faith and speak forth, healing power will flow into a particular person. We saw that in James 5:15. Another thing that's important, of course, is the casting out of demons. We know that Jesus said, or the, in Acts it says how Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So sickness and disease is oppression of the devil. And we see many cases, and we'll just look at a few of these, where demons were cast out in order to see people be set free. Here's where Jesus was teaching and preaching the gospel, healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease among the people, Fame went throughout all Syria. They brought into them all sick people that were taken with divers diseases and torments, and those that were possessed with devils, those ones that had demons, and those that were lunatic, and those that had palsy, and he healed them. How did Jesus get them set free? He would cast out the demons. In Matthew chapter 8, and verse 16, we see where it says, how they brought into him many that were possessed with the devils. And he cast out the spirits. Now, here we have a problem in the King James. It says, says, with his word. Notice his is italicized. You can see it right there. Anything that's italicized is not in the original. It's not there. It was added by the translator in a mistake. He cast out the spirits with word. The word word is the word logos, which means speech. He cast out the spirits with speech. In other words, he would speak forth to cast out the demons. How do we cast out the demons? We speak with our mouth. We command them to come out. In other words, it wasn't done with just speaking the word. It was done with speech, speaking to the demons, which what did we see Jesus do all the time? He would cast them out and command them to come out. And he healed all that were sick, and the people were being set free. Now, we see this casting out happening continually, as well as ministering healing to people. Matthew chapter 9, verse 32, As they went out, behold, they brought unto a dumb man possessed with a devil. When the devil was cast out, the dumb spake. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It's never so seen in Israel. We see another case in Matthew 12, verse 22, where he says, Brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him, insomuch that the dumb, blind and dumb, both spake and saw. Here he cast out the blind and the dumb spirits, and it caused the person who was blind and dumb to be able to speak and to be able to see. We see the fact that the casting out of the demons is necessary in order to destroy the works of the enemy. Matthew 17, 15, here's the one who he had a son who was fallen in the fire and in the water. Demons were causing this. He brought him disciples. They couldn't cure him, he says. Jesus said, how long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. He rebuked the devil and departed at him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Jesus cast out the demons. In fact, we see, talking about Jesus, he did it every place he went. In Mark chapter 1 and verse 39, it says, He preached the synagogue throughout all Galilee, and he cast out devils. Every place he was going, seeing the people be set free. And is this for us today? You better believe it. Mark 16, 17 says, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. Now, why do we need to cast them out? Because the demons are the root of the problem. The spirits are the root of the problem. As you cast out the spirits, then you get rid of the spiritual source of the physical sickness and physical disease.
Another way that healing can be released, and this is when things happen instantly usually, is through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. These are special manifestations of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. It's given to profit others. And it starts listing out the nine gifts of the Spirit here. And in the midst of it, it talks about the gifts of healing. It's really gifts of healings. It's plural. You can have a gift of healing in one area. Someone can else can have a gift of healing in another area. There are gifts, multiple, of healings, different areas, by the same Spirit. So, gifts of healings can be manifest through the Holy Spirit. If you have that gift of healing, God would want to use you to minister that to other people. And if you have a particular gift of healing, God will use you as you go and pray for others or pray, lay hands on them some way. The gift of healing, usually when the gifts of healings are in operation, they're usually miraculous, usually instantaneous in many, most, in many, many cases. People that operate, such like evangelists, some of the evangelists that have lots of miracles and so forth, those are gifts of healing and miracles that are manifesting, that are doing these instantaneous type works. It is simply gifts that go along with the ministry gift that they have. The evangelist will preach the gospel and then he goes forth to minister healing and these are gifts that will manifest out of them. That's why you see these instantaneous type miracles happen. Praise God when they happen. Do we live by them? No. What do we live by? Our faith. What's, what are we are supposed to use our faith to see all the promises of God come to pass? Also, there can be special anointings for healing and deliverance that can come through transfer of the anointing into handkerchiefs. In Acts 19.11, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, diseases departed from them, and evil spirits went out of them. You can use a handkerchief or an apron or something and someone anoint it or lay hands on it and the anointing will go into that and what will happen? It says here that special miracles can happen because here from this, the diseases departed from them, the evil spirits went out of them. So miraculous spirits or miraculous power can be released into articles of clothing or into handkerchiefs or something and then laid upon a person and see healing come forth. Now fasting can be a help in, in driving out spirits that are especially strong. Normally you can cast out spirits with your faith. This is a case where the disciples couldn't cast them out and in verse 20 uh, Jesus said, told them why they couldn't cast them out. He said, because of your unbelief. They needed to get their faith developed. At the same time, he did tell them, this kind, this particular kind, goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. This kind refers to a particular type of spirit, apparently. There are different types of spirits, and some are stronger than others. Is fasting necessary to cast out demons? No. We can, the only case where we see that any mention of, fa of ca fasting in conjunction with casting out the spirits. Casting out can, so can be a help, certainly, uh, or fasting can be a help when casting out, but it's not a requirement. But if you have a case where you're having a problem casting a spirit out, then fasting can be something that is necessary, fasting and prayer combined together, praise God. Also. We see that the Word of God, as you either speak the Word or pray the Word or act upon the Word, can also produce healing. We see in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20, he says, Attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thy heart, thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. Their life unto those that find them, and their health to all their flesh. God's Word, when you begin to speak it, you begin to receive God's Word, <clears throat> it will produce healing. We know from in Psalms 107, hearing the word can produce healing in your life. We see in Psalms 107, verse 20, he says this, He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. The word of God will bring healing. We see in Proverbs 12, verse 18, 
There is that spe speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. That tells you something. How are you going to release this healing? With your mouth. Your mouth is going to speak it into being when you are wise. Now, we must also understand that deliverance and healing are different. Deliverance is casting out the demons. Healing is releasing healing power to flow into a person. Sometimes deliverance produces healing. In other cases, deliverance coupled together with ministering healing produces the results. Now, not everything is necessarily a demon. You can just have a problem and healing can be laid hands and healing can flow into a person. Demons come in from the open door of sin, having given place to the devil. We see that from our own sins, and it's also from the inherited generational iniquity curses, that's where most all the demons have come in from. Because the Bible says the iniquity of the fathers are visited upon the children to the third and fourth generation. That's why we see cancer coming down the line, diabetes down the line, heart problems down the line, some kind of arthritis down the line. What is that? Inherited generational iniquity curses. Why are they coming down the line? Because of the sins of the forefathers. Those, anything that's opened the door from sin is going to be demonically rooted because it has given place to the devil. And these spirits have come in to cause that problem. So this is why we cast out the demons that are the root of it, and then we minister healing to the person. One of the things that you can always do, which is what I do all the time, in the, whether you realize it or not, in the deliverance room, is we do two, well, as far as healing, whenever I'm laying hands on a person, and whenever you lay hands on a person, the Bible says lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. It doesn't even say anything about saying anything. So as we're casting out the demons and laying hands on the person, we're doing two things simultaneously. We're casting the demons out or releasing healing power to flow into the person at the very same time. Now, sometimes people have had prayer for healing and it seems like the problem is gone, but then it shows up again later. Why? Healing can go in and can affect a physical change, because healing will bring a physical change, but it won't get rid of the spirits. And if the spirits are still there, which if you haven't cast them out, they are, it'll manifest the problem again. That's why deliverance and healing need to go together. Deliverance is important. Sometimes the deliverance solved the whole problem. Jesus cast out the dumb spirits, the deaf spirits, the blind spirits, and that solved the whole problem. In other cases, he dealt with a spirit and also ministered healing. So you can, sometimes you need to do both. But one thing's for sure, we need to cast out spirits where spirits are there. And we find, see, why do we have so many spirits? Because we got so much sin and from iniquity from our inheritance line, as well as our own life, and even being victimized in our life. That's why Jesus said, these signs, first sign following the believer was to cast out demons, and then also laying hands on the sick, and then they will recover. Now, you also need to understand that healing is a process. This is deliverance is a process. Healing can also be a process. It doesn't always happen instantaneously. Now, when it happens instantaneously, usually there has been a gift of faith many times in operation. Or, if your faith is developed such to receive an instantaneous healing, it can happen. Because it says, according to your faith, be unto you. At the same time, we know from the scriptures that we saw, where James 5, 15, where the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Didn't say it's going to immediately do it. Shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Same thing we saw over in Mark chapter 16, in verse 18, when we looked at this, where it says that lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It doesn't tell you when. It just means in the future. Healing, it can be a process. We even saw that. In Luke chapter 17, these people needed to show forth their faith as they were the lepers going forth. And it says, as they went, they were cleansed. Not immediately, but as they went, they were cleansed. We see another case that things just don't happen immediately. In John chapter 4, verse 46, here's a case where there was a nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. And he heard of Jesus, he comes to Judea and to Galilee, he goes to him, besought him that he'd come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Jesus said, except you see signs and wonders, you'll not believe. Nobleman said, sir, come down, ere my child die. 
Jesus says, Go thy way, thy son liveth. He spoke those words, and the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. Now, was the, man, was, the, was the son healed immediately when Jesus spoke that? No. How do we know? As he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. So the result occurred. Then he inqu inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. Otherwise, changes began to occur. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. The father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, himself believed, and his whole house. He began to amend. Jesus dealt with what was there, and then healing began to, he began to amend and began to recover. So healing will be a process. Also, most of the things you see with Jesus were instantaneous. He had all the gifts of the Spirit in operation. He had no sin, no demons in him. His faith was at the highest level, certainly. But we even see one particular case where something didn't happen instantly. And this is important to realize because many people think that, you know, we shouldn't pray more than once. No, we pray continuously. We cast out continuously as we're driving out the spirits until we drive them all out. Mark 8, 22. They came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man unto him, besought him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town. When he spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, notice he's releasing healing through the hands, he asked him if he saw aught. Here he was touching, he put spit on his eyes, so he was releasing something to touch his eyes. He looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Well, the guy couldn't see a thing before. Now he's seeing men as trees walking. Is he seeing clear? No. Was there obviously a change? Yes. Was the job done? No. What did Jesus do? After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes. Why did he do that? to release healing power to flow into him again and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. What does that show you? Jesus prayed more than once. The first time, the power of God did not solve the whole problem, even with Jesus. Therefore, what do we do? We continually pray until the job is done. You continually confess the word. You continually pray the prayer of faith. You continually release healing power into a person until the job is done. You continually cast out the demons until you drive the demons out. And remember, there's quite a network of demons that has to be driven out of us. It was certainly is something that we must realize that we continually apply our faith through praying without ceasing, praying in faith, in order to see the healing come to pass. And what will God do? God will bring forth healing because your faith will make you whole. The reason why we have to major on casting out is because we have so much sin in the inheritance line. And that's our major problem. Most everything, you start looking at all the problems you have, probably almost, I'd say 95% of all the people that I've worked with, almost, there's always things in their life that are come down the inheritance line. Think about the problems in your life. A lot of them have come in from inheritance. And those need to be dealt with. Now, other things, of course, can come into your life. But a lot of things are all linked to things from the inheritance line. So as you cast out those spirits, and remember, they come in from inheritance, your own sins, and then you take hold of healing through some means, whether it's anointing with oil, laying hands, prayer of faith, prayer of agreement, whatever it might be, some means of releasing healing, taking hold of the promise, speaking it into being, you will see that your faith will make you whole. Now, as you're working your faith, your faith will get strong. And it's important that you work your faith continually until you see the results because your faith will make you whole and according to your faith he said be it unto you that's why we got to see our faith grow strong that's what happened with Abraham and the results came it doesn't say so but it's very possible that his faith needed to get developed before he saw the promise It was 25 years but one thing for sure his faith did grow strong he did give glory to God and also, Sarah had to come to the place of taking hold of the power of God to conceive seed. And when they did it, they saw the results come to pass. So we've got to work our faith and cause our faith to grow strong so we can see the results. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that reveals that I can be healed and it will come through my faith. Whether I'm casting out the demons or taking hold of healing 
through some means of receiving. My faith will make me whole. I am going to put my faith in operation. I'm going to develop my faith as I hear the word and act on the word and speak the word and do what it says. As I develop my faith, my faith will get strong and I will receive the promise of God. Thank you, Lord. I have the faith of Jesus. I got the same spirit of faith and I'm going to work my faith and I'm going to see it produce the healing power of God, the delivering power of God, and see me be set free. Thank you, Lord. My faith will heal me and make me whole. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, we've got more to talk about. We're going to be, got more things to go over coming up on Sunday as we're we're not going to leave this area qu quickly. We want to be sure that you get thoroughly established in the area of healing because it's a major deal that people need. If you're not having a problem yourself, certainly you know people that are sick. So we need to really get established in healing. Everything that the Word says, so we're going to talk more about it on Sunday morning. If you need prayer, I invite you to come forward. Otherwise, glad to go ahead and dismiss. Any questions, be glad to answer them. Otherwise, God bless. Have a wonderful week. Questions? Yeah, okay. Do you have a question? Hebrews.